Chapter Five of G. K. Chesterton's Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G. K. Chesterton's Charles Dickens, Chapter Five, The Great Popularity. There is one aspect of Charles Dickens which must be of interest even to that subterranean race which does not admire his books. Even if we were not interested in Dickens as a great event in English literature, we must still be interested in him as a great event in English history. If he had not his place with Fielding and Thackeray, he would still have his place with Wat Tyler and Wilkes, for the man led a mob. He did what no English statesman, perhaps, has really done. He called out the people. He was popular in a sense of which we moderns have not even a notion. In that sense, there is no popularity now. There are no popular authors today. We call such authors as Mr. Guy Boothby or Mr. William Le Queux popular authors, but this is popularity altogether in a weaker sense not only in quantity but in quality. The old popularity was positive, the new is negative. There is a great deal of difference between the eager man who wants to read a book and the tired man who wants a book to read. A man reading a Lequeux mystery wants to get to the end of it. A man reading the Dickens novel wished that it might never end. Men read a Dickens story six times because they knew it so well. If a man can read a Le Queux story six times, it's only because he can forget it six times. In short, the Dickens novel was popular not because it was an unreal world, but because it was a real world, a world in which the soul could live. The modern shocker at its very best is an interlude in life. But in the days when Dickens's work was coming out in serial, people talked as if real life were itself the interlude between one issue of Pickwick and another. In reaching the period of the publication of Pickwick, we reach this sudden apotheosis of Dickens. Henceforward he filled the literary world in a way hard to imagine. Fragments of that huge fashion remain in our daily language. In the talk of every trade or public question are embedded the wrecks of that enormous religion. Men give out the airs of Dickens without even opening his books, just as Catholics can live in a tradition of Christianity without having looked at the New Testament. The man in the street has more memories of Dickens, whom he has not read, than of Marie Corelli, whom he has. There is nothing in any way parallel to the omnipresence and vitality in the great comic characters of Boz. There are no modern Bumbles or Pecksniffs, no modern Gamps and Micawbers. Mr. Rudyard Kipling, to take an author of a higher type than those before mentioned, is called, and called justly, a popular author, that is to say he is widely read, greatly enjoyed, and highly remunerated. He has achieved the paradox of at once making poetry and making money. But let any one who wishes to see the difference try the experiment of assuming the Kipling characters to be common property like the Dickens characters. Let any one go into an average parlour and allude to Strickland, as he would allude to Mr. Bumble the Beadle. Let any one say that anybody is a perfect Leroy, as he would say, a perfect Pecksniff. Let any one write a comic paragraph for a halfpenny paper, and allude to Mrs. Hawksby instead of Mrs. Gamp. He will soon discover that the modern world has forgotten its own fiercest booms more completely than it has forgotten this formless tradition from its fathers. The mere dregs of it come to more than any contemporary excitement. The gleaning of the grapes of Pickwick is more than the whole vintage of Soldiers Three. There is one instance, and I think only one, of an exception to this generalization. There is one figure in our popular literature which would really be recognized by the populace. Ordinary men would understand you if you referred currently to Sherlock Holmes. 
Sir Arthur Conan Doyle would no doubt be justified in rearing his head to the stars, remembering that Sherlock Holmes is the only really familiar figure in modern fiction. But let him droop that head again with a gentle sadness, remembering that if Sherlock Holmes is the only familiar figure in modern fiction, Sherlock Holmes is also the only familiar figure in the Sherlock Holmes tales. Not many people could say offhand what was the name of the owner of Silver Blaze, or whether Mrs. Watson was dark or fair, but if Dickens had written the Sherlock Holmes stories, every character in them would have been equally arresting and memorable. A Sherlock Holmes would have cooked the dinner for Sherlock Holmes, a Sherlock Holmes would have driven his cab. If Dickens brought in a man merely to carry a letter, he had time for a touch or two, and made him a giant. Dickens not only conquered the world, he conquered it with minor characters. Mr. John Smorker, the servant of Mr. Cyrus Bantam, though he merely passes across the stage, is almost as vivid to us as Mr. Samuel Weller, the servant of Mr. Samuel Pickwick. The young man with the lumpy forehead, who only says, Esker, to Mr. Podsnap's foreign gentleman, is as good as Mr. Podsnap himself. They appear only for a fragment of time, but they belong to eternity. We have them only for an instant, but they have us for ever. In dealing with Dickens, then, we are dealing with a man whose public success was a marvel and almost a monstrosity. And here I perceive that my friend, the purely artistic critic, primed himself with Flaubert and Turgenev, can contain himself no longer. He leaps to his feet, upsetting his cup of cocoa, and asks contemptuously what all this has to do with criticism. Why begin your study of an author, he says, with trash about popularity? Boothby is popular, and Le Cue is popular, and Mother Siegel is popular. If Dickens was even more popular, it may only mean that Dickens was even worse. The people like bad literature. If your object is to show that Dickens was good literature, you should rather apologise for his popularity and try to explain it away. You should seek to show that Dickens's work was good literature, although it was popular. Yes, that is your task, to prove that Dickens was admirable, although he was admired. I ask the artistic critic to be patient for a little and to believe that I have a serious reason for registering this historic popularity. To that we shall come presently, but as a manner of approach I may perhaps ask leave to examine this actual and fashionable statement to which I have supposed him to have recourse, the statement that the people like bad literature, and even like literature because it is bad. This way of stating the thing is an error and in that error lies matter of much import to Dickens and his destiny in letters. The public does not like bad literature. The public likes a certain kind of literature, and likes that kind of literature, even when it is bad, better than another kind of literature, even when it's good. Nor is this unreasonable, for the line between different types of literature is as real as the line between tears and laughter and to tell people who can only get bad comedy that you should have some first-class tragedy is as irrational as to offer a man who is shivering over weak warm coffee a really superior sort of ice. Ordinary people dislike the delicate modern work not because it is good or because it is bad, but because it is not the thing that they asked for. If, for instance, you find them pent in sterile streets and hungering for adventure and a violent secrecy, and if you give them their choice between A Study in Scarlet, a good detective story, and The Autobiography of Mark Rutherford, a good psychological monologue, no doubt they will prefer A Study in Scarlet. But they will not do so because the autobiography of Mark Rutherford is a very good monologue, but because it is evidently a very poor detective story. They will be indifferent to Les Aveugles, not because it is good drama, but because it is bad melodrama. They do not like good introspective sonnets, but neither do they like bad introspective sonnets, of which there are many. When they walk behind the brass of the Salvation Army Band, instead of listening to harmonies at Queen's Hall, it is always assumed that they prefer bad music. But it is merely that they prefer military music, 
music marching down the open street, and that if Dan Godfrey's band could be smitten with salvation and lead them, they would like that even better. And while they might easily get more satisfaction out of a screaming article in the war cry than out of a page of Emerson about the oversoul, this would not be because the page of Emerson is another and superior kind of literature. It would be because the page of Emerson is another and inferior kind of religion. Dickens stands first as a defiant monument of what happens when a great literary genius has a literary taste akin to that of the community. For this kinship was deep and spiritual. Dickens was not like our ordinary demagogues and journalists. Dickens did not write what the people wanted. Dickens wanted what the people wanted. And with this was connected the other fact, which must never be forgotten, and which I have more than once insisted on, that Dickens and his school had a hilarious faith in democracy, and thought of the service of it as a sacred priesthood. Hence there was this vital point in his popularism, that there was no condescension in it. The belief that the rabble will only read rubbish can be read between the lines of all our contemporary writers, even of those writers whose rubbish the rabble reads. Mr. Fergus Hume has no more respect for the populace than Mr. George Moore. The only difference lies between those writers who will consent to talk down to the people, and those writers who will not consent to talk down to the people. But Dickens never talked down to the people. He talked up to the people. He approached the people like a deity, and poured out his riches and his blood. This is what makes the immortal bond between him and the masses of men. He had not merely produced something that they could understand, but he took it seriously, and toiled and agonized to produce it. They were not only enjoying one of the best writers, they were enjoying the best he could do. His raging and sleepless nights, his wild walks in the darkness, his notebooks crowded, his nerves in rags, all this extraordinary output was but a fit sacrifice to the ordinary man. He climbed towards the lower classes. He panted upwards on weary wings to reach the heaven of the poor. His power, then, lay in the fact that he expressed with an energy and brilliancy quite uncommon the things close to the common mind. But with this mere phrase, the common mind, we collide with a current error. Commonness and the common mind are now generally spoke of as meaning in some manner inferiority and the inferior mind, the mind of the mere mob. But the common mind means the mind of all the artists and heroes, or else it would not be common. Plato had the common mind, Dante had the common mind, or the mind that was not common. Commonness means the quality common to the saint and the sinner, to the philosopher and the fool, and it was this that Dickens grasped and developed. In everybody there is a certain thing that loves babies, that fears death, that likes sunlight, that thing enjoys Dickens. And everybody does not mean uneducated crowds, everybody means everybody. Everybody means Mrs. Mennell. This lady, a cloistered and fastidious writer, has written one of the best eulogies of Dickens that exist, an essay in praise of his pungent perfection of epithet. And when I say that everybody understands Dickens, I do not mean that he is suited to the untaught intelligence. I mean that he is so plain that even scholars can understand him. The best expression of the fact, however, is to be found in noting the two things in which he is most triumphant. In order of artistic value, next after his humour comes his horror. And both his humour and his horror are of a kind strictly to be called human. That is, they belong to the basic part of us, below the lowest roots of our variety. His horror, for instance, is a healthy churchyard horror, a fear of the grotesque defamation called death, and this every man has, even if he also has the more delicate and depraved fears that come of an evil spiritual outlook. We may be afraid of a fine shade with Henry James, that is, we may be afraid of the world, we may be afraid of a taut silence with Maeterlinck, that is, we may be afraid of our own souls, but everyone will certainly be afraid of a Cock Lane ghost, 
including Henry James and Maeterlinck. This latter is literally a mortal fear, a fear of death. It is not the immortal fear or fear of damnation which belongs to all the more refined intellects of our day. In a word, Dickens does, in the exact sense, make the flesh creep. He does not, like the decadents, make the soul crawl. And the creeping of the flesh on being reminded of its fleshly failure is a strictly universal thing which we can all feel, while some of us are as yet uninstructed in the art of spiritual crawling. In the same way, the Dickens' mirth is a part of man and universal. All men can laugh at broad humour, even the subtle humorists. Even the modern flaneur, who can smile at a particular combination of green and yellow, would laugh at Mr. Lammel's request for Mr. Fledgeby's nose. In a word, the common things are common, even to the uncommon people. These two primary dispositions of Dickens, to make the flesh creep and to make the sides ache, were a sort of twins of his spirit. They were never far apart, and the fact of their affinity is interestingly exhibited in the first two novels. Generally he mixed the two up in a book and mixed a great many other things with them. As a rule he cared little if he kept six stories of quite different colours running in the same book. The effect was sometimes similar to that of playing six tunes at once. He does not mind the coarse, tragic figure of Jonas Chuzzlewit crossing the mental stage, which is full of the allegorical pantomime of Eden, Mr. Chollop, and the Watertoast Gazette, a scene which is as much of a satire as Gulliver, and nearly as much of a fairy tale. He does not mind binding up a rather pompous sketch of prostitution in the same book with an adorable impossibility like Bunsby. But Pickwick is so far a coherent thing that it is coherently comic and consistently rambling, and as a consequence his next book was, upon the whole, coherently and consistently horrible. As his natural turn for terrors was kept down in Pickwick, so his natural turn for joy and laughter is kept down in Oliver Twist. In Oliver Twist the smoke of the thieves' kitchen hangs over the whole tale and the shadow of Fagin falls everywhere. The little lamp-lit rooms of Mr. Brownlow and Rose Maylie are to all appearance purposely kept subordinate, a mere foil to the foul darkness without. It was a strange and appropriate accident that Crookshank and not Fizz should have illustrated this book. There was about Crookshank's art a kind of cramped energy which is almost the definition of the criminal mind. His drawings have a dark strength. Yet he does not only draw morbidly, he draws meanly. In the doubled-up figure and frightful eyes of Fagin in the condemned cell, there is not only a baseness of subject, there is a kind of baseness in the very technique of it. It is not drawn with the free lines of a free man, it has the half-witted secrecies of a hunted thief. It does not look merely like a picture of Fagin. It looks like a picture by Fagin. Among these dark and detestable plates there is one which has, with a kind of black directness, the dreadful poetry that does not inhere in the story, stumbling as it often is. It represents Oliver asleep at an open window in the house of one of his humaner patrons, and outside the window, but as big and close as if they were in the room, stand Fagin and the foul-laced monks staring at him with dark monstrous visages and great white wicked eyes in the style of the simple devilry of the draughtsman. The very naivety of the horror is horrifying. The very woodenness of the two wicked men seems to make them worse than mere men who are wicked. But this picture of big devils at the window-sill does express, as has been suggested above, the thread of poetry in the whole thing. The sense, that is, of the thieves as a kind of army of devils compassing earth and sky, crying for Oliver's soul and besieging the house in which he is barred for safety. In this matter there is, I think, a difference between the author and the illustrator. In Crookshank there was surely something morbid, but, sensitive and sentimental as Dickens was, there was nothing morbid in him. He had, as Stevenson had, 
more of the mere boy's love of suffocating stories of blood and darkness, of skulls, of gibbets, of all the things, in a word, that are sombre without being sad. There is a ghastly joy in remembering our boyish reading about Sykes and his flight, especially about the voice of that unbearable peddler which went on in a monotonous and maddening sing-song. We'll wash out grease stains, mud stains, blood stains, until Sykes fled almost screaming. For this boyish mixture of appetite and repugnance, there is a good popular phrase, supping on horrors. Dickens supped on horrors, as he supped on Christmas pudding. He supped on horrors because he was an optimist and could sup on anything. There was no saner or simpler schoolboy than Traddles, who covered all his books with skeletons. Oliver Twist had begun in Bentley's Miscellany, which Dickens edited in 1837. It was interrupted by a blow that for the moment broke the author's spirit, and seems to have broken his heart. His wife's sister, Mary Hogarth, died suddenly. To Dickens, his wife's family seems to have been like his own. His affections were heavily committed to the sisters, and of this one he was peculiarly fond. All his life, through much conceit and sometimes something bordering on selfishness, we can feel the redeeming note of an almost tragic tenderness. He was a man who could really have died of love or sorrow. He took up the work of Oliver Twist again later in the year, and finished it at the end of 1838. His work was incessant and almost bewildering. In 1838 he had already brought out the first number of Nicholas Nickleby, but the great popularity went booming on, the whole world was roaring for books by Dickens, and more books by Dickens, and Dickens was labouring night and day like a factory. Among other things he edited the Memoirs of Grimaldi. The incident is only worth mentioning for the sake of one more example of the silly ease with which Dickens was drawn by criticism, and the clever ease with which he managed in these small squabbles to defend himself. Someone mildly suggested that, after all, Dickens had never known Grimaldi. Dickens was down on him like a thunderbolt, sardonically asking how close an intimacy Lord Baybrook had with Mr. Samuel Pepys. Nicholas Nickleby is the most typical, perhaps, of the tone of his earlier works. It is in form a very rambling, old-fashioned romance, the kind of romance in which the hero is only a convenience for the frustration of the villain. Nicholas is what is called in theatricals a stick, but any stick is good enough to beat a squeers with. That strong thwack, that simplified energy, is the whole object of such a story and the whole of this tale is full of a kind of highly picturesque platitude. The wicked aristocrats, Sir Mulberry Hawk, Lord Verisoft, and the rest, are inadequate versions of the fashionable profligate. But this is not, as some suppose, because Dickens in his vulgarity could not comprehend the refinement of patrician vice. There is no idea more vulgar or more ignorant than the notion that a gentleman is generally what is called refined. The error of the hawk conception is that, if anything, he is too refined. Real aristocratic blackguards do not swagger and rant so well. A real fast baronet would not have defied Nicholas in the tavern with so much oratorical dignity. A real fast baronet would probably have been choked with apoplectic embarrassment and said nothing at all. But Dickens read into this aristocracy a grandiloquence and a natural poetry which, like all melodrama, is really the precious jewel of the poor. But the book contains something which is much more Dickensian. It is exquisitely characteristic of Dickens that the truly great achievement of the story is the person who delays the story. Mrs. Nickleby, with her beautiful mazes of memory, does her best to prevent the story of Nicholas Nickleby from being told, and she does well. There is no particular necessity that we should know what happens to Madeline Bray. There is a desperate and crying necessity that we should know Mrs. Nickleby once had a foot-boy who had a wart on his nose, and a driver who had a green shade over his left eye. If Mrs. Nickleby is a fool, she is one of those fools who are wiser than the world. She stands for a great truth that we must not forget the truth that experience is not in real life a saddening thing at all. 
The people who have had misfortunes are generally the people who love to talk about them. Experience is really one of the gaieties of old age, one of its dissipations. Mere memory becomes a kind of debauch. Experience may be disheartening to those who are foolish enough to try and coordinate it, and to draw deductions from it, but to those happy souls like Mrs. Nickleby, to whom relevancy is nothing, the whole of their past life is like an inexhaustible fairyland. Just as we take a rambling walk because we know that a whole district is beautiful, so they indulge a rambling mind because they know that a whole existence is interesting. A boy does not plunge into his future more romantically and at random than they plunge into their past. Another gleam in this book is Mr. Mantellini. Of him, as of all the really great comic characters of Dickens, it is impossible to speak with any critical adequacy. Perfect absurdity is a direct thing, like physical pain or a strong smell. A joke is a fact. However indefensible it, it is, it cannot be attacked. However defensible it is, it cannot be defended. That Mr. Mantellini should say in praising the outline of his wife. The two countesses had no outlines, and the dowager's was a damned outline. This can only be called an unanswerable absurdity. You may try to analyse it, as Charles Lamb did the indefensible joke about the hair. You may dwell for a moment on the dark distinctions between the negative disqualification of the countess and the positive disqualification of the dowager, but you will not capture the violent beauty of it in any way. She will be a lovely widow, I shall be a body. Some handsome women will cry, she will laugh damnably. This vision of demoniac heartlessness has the same defiant finality. I mention the matter here, but it has to be remembered, in connection with all the comic masterpieces of Dickens. Dickens has greatly suffered with the critics precisely through this stunning simplicity in his best work. The critic is called upon to describe his sensations while enjoying Mantellini and Micawber, and he can no more describe them than he can describe a blow in the face. Thus Dickens, in this self-conscious, analytical, and descriptive age, loses both ways. He is doubly unfitted for the best modern criticism. His bad work is below that criticism. His good work is above it. But. Gigantic as were Dickens's labours, gigantic as were the exactions from him, his own plans were more gigantic still. He had the type of mind that wishes to do every kind of work at once, to do everybody's work as well as its own. There floated before him a vision of a monstrous magazine, entirely written by himself. It is true that when this scheme came to be discussed, he suggested that other pens might be occasionally employed, but reading between the lines it is sufficiently evident that he thought of the thing as a kind of vast multiplication of himself, with Dickens as editor opening letters, Dickens as leader-writer writing leaders, Dickens as reporter reporting meetings, Dickens as reviewer reviewing books, Dickens, for all I know, as office boy opening and shutting doors. This serial, of which he spoke to Messrs. Chapman and Hall, began— and broke off, and remains as a colossal fragment, bound together under the title of Master Humphrey's Clock. One characteristic thing he wished to have in the periodical. He suggested an Arabian Nights of London, in which the Gog and Magog, the giants of the city, should give forth chronicles as enormous as themselves. He had a taste for these schemes, or frameworks for many tales, he made and abandoned many, many he half fulfilled. I strongly suspect that he meant Major Jackman in Mrs. Lirriper's lodgings and Mrs. Lirriper's legacy to start a series of studies of that lady's lodgers, a kind of history of No. 81 Norfolk Street, Strand. The Seven Poor Travellers was planned for seven stories, we will not say seven poor stories. Dickens had meant, probably, to write a tale for each article of somebody's luggage. He only got as far as the hat and the boots. This gigantesque scale of literary architecture, huge and yet curiously cosy, is characteristic of his spirit, fond of size and yet fond of comfort. He liked to have story within story, like room within room of some labyrinthine but comfortable castle. In this spirit he wished 
Master Humphrey's clock to begin, and to be a big frame or bookcase for numberless novels. The clock started, but the clock stopped. In the prologue by Master Humphrey reappear Mr. Pickwick and Sam Weller, and of that resurrection many things have been said, chiefly expressions of a reasonable regret. Doubtless they do not add much to their author's reputation, but they add a great deal to their author's pleasure. It was ingrained in him to wish to meet old friends. All his characters are, so to speak, designed to be old friends. In the sense, every Dickens character is an old friend, even when he first appears. He comes to us mellow out of many implied interviews, and carries the firelight on his face. Dickens was simply pleased to meet Pickwick again, and being pleased, he made the old man too comfortable to be amusing. But Master Humphrey's clock is now scarcely known except as the shell of one of the well-known novels. The old curiosity shop was published in accordance with the original clock scheme. Perhaps the most typical thing about it is the title. There seems no reason in particular at the first and most literal glance why the story should be called after the old curiosity shop. Only two of the pages have anything to do with such a shop, and they leave it forever in the first few pages. It is as if Thackeray had called the whole novel of Vanity Fair Miss Pinkerton's Academy. It is as if Scott had given the whole story of the antiquary the title of The Whore's Inn. But when we feel the situation with more fidelity, we realise that this title is something in the nature of a key to the whole Dickens romance. His tales always started from some splendid hint in the streets. And shops, perhaps the most poetical of all things, often set off his fancy galloping. Every shop, in fact, was to him the door of romance. Among all the huge serial schemes of which we have spoken, it is a matter of wonder that he never started an endless periodical called The Street and divided it into shops. He could have written an exquisite romance called The Baker's Shop, another called The Chemist's Shop, another called The Oil Shop, to keep company with The Old Curiosity Shop. Some incomparable baker he invented and forgot, some gorgeous chemist might have been, some more than mortal oil man is lost to us for ever. This Old Curiosity Shop he did happen to linger by. Its tale he did happen to tell. Around Little Nell, of course, a controversy raged and rages. Some implored Dickens not to kill her at the end of the story. Some regret that he didn't kill her at the beginning. To me the chief interest in this young person lies in the fact that she is an example, and the most celebrated example, of what must have been, I think, a personal peculiarity, perhaps a personal experience of Dickens, there is, of course, no paradox at all in saying that if we find in a good book a wildly impossible character, it is very probable indeed that it was copied from a real person. This is one of the commonplaces of good art criticism, for although people talk of the restraints of fact and the freedom of fiction, the case for most artistic purposes is quite the other way. Nature is as free as air, art is forced to look probable. There may be a million things that do happen, yet only one thing that convinces us is likely to happen. Out of a million possible things there may be only one appropriate thing. I fancy, therefore, that many stiff, unconvincing characters are copied from the wild freak show of real life. And in many parts of Dickens's work there is evidence of some peculiar affection on his part for a strange sort of little girl, a girl with a premature sense of responsibility and duty a sort of saintly precocity. Did he know some little girl of this kind? Did she die, perhaps, and remain in his memory in colours too ethereal and pale? In any case, there are a great number of them in his works. Little Dorrit was one of them, and Florence Dombey with her brother, and even Agnes in infancy, and, of course, little Nell. And in any case, one thing is evident— Whatever charm these children may have, they have not the charm of childhood. They are not little children, they are little mothers. The beauty and divinity in a child lie in his not being worried, not being conscientious, not being like little Nell. Little Nell has never any of the sacred bewilderment of a baby. 
She never wears that face, beautiful but almost half-witted, with which a real child half understands that there is evil in the universe. As usual, however, little as the story has to do with the title, the splendid and satisfying pages have even less to do with the story. Dick Swiveller is perhaps the noblest of all the noble creations of Dickens. He has all the overwhelming absurdity of Mantellini, with the addition of being human and credible, for he knows that he's absurd. His highfalutin is not done because he seriously thinks it's right and proper, like that of Mr. Snodgrass, nor is it done because he thinks it will serve his turn, like that of Mr. Pecksniff, for both these beliefs are improbable. It is done because he really loves highfalutin, because he has a lonely literary pleasure in exaggerative language. Great draughts of words are to him like great draughts of wine, pungent and yet refreshing, light and yet leaving him in a glow. In unerring instinct for the perfect folly of a phrase he has no equal, even among the giants of Dickens. "'I am sure,' says Mrs. Wackles, when she has been flirting with Cheggs the market-gardener, and reduced Mr. Swiveller to Byronic renunciation, "'I am sure I am very sorry if—' "'Sorry,' said Mr. Swiveller, "'sorry in the possession of a Cheggs.' The abyss of bitterness is unfathomable. Scarcely less precious is the poise of Mr. Swiveller, when he imitates the stage brigand. After crying, "'Some wine here! Ho!' he hands the flagon to himself with profound humility, and receives it haughtily. Perhaps the very best scene in the book is that between Mr. Swiveller and the single gentleman with whom he endeavours to remonstrate for having remained in bed all day. We cannot have single gentlemen coming into the place and sleeping like double gentlemen without paying extra. An equal amount of slumber was never got out of one bed, and if you want to sleep like that you must pay for a double-bedded room. His relations with the Marchioness are at once purely romantic and purely genuine. There is nothing even of Dickens's legitimate exaggerations about them. A shabby, blarky, good-natured clerk would, as a matter of fact, spend hours in the society of a little servant-girl if he found her about the house. It would arise partly from a dim kindliness, and partly from that mysterious instinct which is sometimes called, mistakenly, a love of low company. That mysterious instinct which makes so many men of pleasure find something soothing in the society of uneducated people, particularly uneducated women. It is the instinct which accounts for the otherwise unaccountable popularity of barmaids. And still the pot of that huge popularity boiled. In 1841 another novel was demanded and Barnaby Rudge supplied. It is chiefly of interest as an embodiment of that other element in Dickens, the picturesque or even the pictorial. Barnaby Rudge, the idiot with his rags and his feathers and his raven, the bestial hangman, the blind mob, all make a picture, though they hardly make a novel. One touch there is in it of the richer and more humorous Dickens, the boy conspirator, Mr. Sim Tappertit. But he might have been treated with more sympathy, with as much sympathy, for instance, as Mr. Dick Swiveller, for he is only the romantic gutter-snipe, the bright boy at the particular age when it is most fascinating to found a secret society, and most difficult to keep a secret. And if ever there was a romantic gutter-snipe on earth it was Charles Dickens. Barnaby Rudge is no more an historical novel than Sim's Secret League was a political movement, but they are both beautiful creations. When all is said, however, the main reason for mentioning the work here is that it is the next bubble in the pot the next thing that burst out of that whirling, seething head. The tide of it rose and smoked and sang till it boiled over the pot of Britain and poured over all America. In the January of 1842 he set out for the United States. End of chapter 5